Hello, everybody. We are really pleased to be here today. My name is Gustavo Serafini. I'm going to be the moderator for the Home Smart Home Roundtable discussion. I have a brilliant panel with us today. Uh, most of us have been in the film. Kimberly Warner was the director in the film. And I would like to take a brief moment. Let's just go around and introduce ourselves. Um, I'll go ahead and get it started. My name is Gustavo Serafini. I am the co-founder of Pure Audio Video, which is a smart home integration company down in South Florida. And I am also the co-host or the host of the Enable Disabled podcast. I am here as a universal design expert and smart home specialist. I am, we all, we all have the livable background on our screens. So it's uh, different shades of purple with uh, the livable logo. That's like a house in different colors. I am a middle-aged Latin American male and I have olive skin. My hair is brown and it's combed to the front and I am wearing a navy blue polo shirt. So let's continue. Kyle, can you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you? Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Kyle Chronic. I am 31 years old. Uh, I am a full-time student at Colorado State University Global. Um, I am also a panelist on Unfixed Media's uh, MS Confidential, and I've been living with this progressive disability, multiple sclerosis for uh, over 10 years, almost 11 years now, uh, and uh, it's progressive in nature, so it's uh, always changing my, uh, the needs uh, of my house and uh, how I need to adapt. Um, my house is very old, so I got a lot of ideas or desires. <laughs> Thank you. Shelly, can you go next? Yes, of course. Hi, I'm Shelly Rosenberg. I'm an interior designer in Dallas, Texas. I am a middle-aged white woman with sandy brown hair and glasses. I'm really excited to be here because I specialize in adapting design in homes and businesses for people that um, have disability and live with disability. And I'm uh, just super excited to be here and share new ideas with you all and everyone watching today. Thank you, Shelly. It's, we're really happy that you're here with us. Uh, Bethany? Happy to. Um, my name is Bethany Cook and I'm in my early 30s, currently a master's student studying counseling and psychology and um, located in the Seattle area. So I am uh, a white woman with short brown hair that is curly. And um, actually I'll describe my background as well since I don't have the livable background up um, behind me here. I've got a window on my uh, left-hand side, part of a window, concrete wall and sheetrock behind me, um, kind of painted an off-white color and then slightly somewhat of a poster that you can see there of Seattle um, as that's where I'm currently living. And I am living with narcolepsy type one, which means narcolepsy with cataplexy. Um, that's a sudden loss of muscle weakness included in that diagnosis as well. And I have been involved with Unfix since the very beginning, um, an OG as we like to say. So uh, great to be here. Thank you so much, Bethany. Kim? My name is Kimberly Warner, and I am the founder and director of Unfixed Media, and um, I am a Caucasian woman, 47 years old. Um, I have blonde hair, and I'm wearing glasses, and a red zip-up shirt, and the sleeves kind of blend into the livable design summit background, so it looks like I don't have arms right now. Um, <laughs> and um, I live with Malde debarkment syndrome. I've had it for about six years and was diagnosed about four years ago. And um, that is a neurological disorder that leaves me with a sensation of constantly being on a boat. Um, I am really looking forward to this conversation. Fantastic, thank you so much. So the first question that I have, and every, anybody can jump in, and if, uh, if we're a little shy, I'll, I'll, I'll pick somebody. Um, after being in this movie or having seen this movie that Kim did for the Home Smart Home, do you have any, any additional thoughts as to 
what you would like to see in a home or how this project has made you maybe shift your thinking as to what could be possible? I'll jump uh, in. Okay. I, I, I mean, I had the, the great fortune to hear, oh, how many are there? There were nine subjects in this film. And so I was blown away when I started receiving their submissions, their videos talking about how their homes are challenging for them and imagining what could change. So, I mean, I, I truly did not think deeply about this until I started to receive um, everyone's thoughts. Um, and what really stood out for me is the, the neurological impact of a space and, and you know, the mobility and the, the, the spaciousness and how we move around and the flow, that was something that I had kind of been introduced to before, but not as much the, the sounds, the smells, the sights, the lighting, the, you know, the acoustics, that, that really struck me as something that even if you're not neurologically uh, challenged, those can aggravate um, any, anybody. And they're probably almost on a subtle level. So, you know, I, it just has gotten me um, to really consider how lighting especially is being used in my home. If I may jump on that, I was so deeply moved by this film. Everyone needs to see it. I want all of my friends and family to see it. Uh, I learned so much and it made me feel like we are simpatico and possibly soulmates. I just have so much to learn from you all. I have three children um, that have various disability. Um, my middle one is autistic and my little one has Down syndrome. And a lot of the work I've done is with families with small children and children that cannot verbalize the challenges that they're facing or the struggles that they have daily. And I think this film opened my eyes to the fact that I have this incredible community of people with disability that are uh, older and can articulate what they need and just can teach me so much. It's, it's really exciting for me to start to learn what the disability community needs, the breadth of those needs, and then to help translate that to other designers and architects so that our industry that has so much power to help can really understand why we need to do it and what it is that we can do and how we can start. That's terrific, Shelley. Yeah, I, I love, I, I love uh, just being a part of this, this concept. Uh, before I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, I, I didn't know anybody with uh, a physical disability. So this wasn't anything I even considered. Um, and even when I was first diagnosed, uh, I was minimally impaired. So I did not have anything really in my way. Um, but yeah, as I was saying, uh, as I have progressed and after uh, working with Kimberly uh, on this video, I have uh, noticed a few things. Kimberly, you just saying, talking about the lighting. Another thing I had never even considered uh, and I've kind of just adapted and learned how to uh, navigate in the dark, uh, which is not safe. Uh, I need ample lighting uh, and I do a lot of wall walking if I don't have a mobility aid, like a cane or a walker close to me. Um, I was thinking of uh, trying to incorporate some kind of something into architectural design uh, for wall walking. Um, what I was thinking, what came to mind was like rock climbing. Um, people that have like the things to grab onto. Um, that was just something that came to mind for me. So Kyle, I love that. I have to jump in really quick because okay. Kyle, when you talked about that in the your video, you said I, I would love to have grab bars all over the place or something yes. that acts as grab bars, which uh, I love that you added that because it doesn't have to look like hmm. grab bars. I mean, it could be this cool design or a rock climbing cool. wall that yes, is like uh, super awesome. Right, yeah. Kyle, would you want to use that in like the hallways that were more narrow where the mobility device is difficult? Or is this something that like, if you, you prefer to walk, 
in that way, you know, as, you know, a form of exercise or it just feels better. So is that something that, you know, you'd like to see everywhere or just in certain places? Um, uh, my house is pretty old. So the hallways and everything is already pretty narrow. Um, but I would like to see that uh, kind of everywhere. I think that would be very effective because I, I do kind of use uh, my narrow hallways or uh, my kitchen super narrow. I use that to my advantage for like physical therapy and stuff. Um, so yeah, I could, I could go both ways. I really enjoy listening to these ideas because I consider designers and architects undiscovered allies to the disability community. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the reasons interior designers, architects, and a lot of our clients that maybe don't have a disability yet, um, as we know, we all will at some point in our lives, um, a lot of people think that the remedy to this has to look institutional or hospital-like. Mm -hmm. It might be embarrassing to our friends. It might be sort of, um, you know, we're, we're showing people that we're weak or that we have issues or challenges. And so there's this mind shift, I think, that needs to take place um, that these um, adaptations we might make to our environment is an empowering, beautiful, uh, cool thing that gives us, um, you know, just more confidence and makes things better for everyone that visits and for us. And it doesn't have to be this sad, confronting, emotionally, you know, perplexing conversation. It can be super empowering. And I think not only can we now start to prove how much better it is um, for just people's mental health, but also, um, you know, on interior design and architects side of things, um, there's just so much more integrity and expertise that they could share with their clients. Um, there's additional equipment and things that they may not know about yet that they can easily provide for their clients. I just think this is um, such an important conversation to have. Um, these things shouldn't be that difficult. It's just, it's about creativity. And, and I applaud you with your ideas about the rock climbing walls or something to hang on to because, yeah. um, it's a great idea and it's a fun idea. And um, you're right. It doesn't have to look like, you know, hospital grab bars or something like that. It, it can be, right. it can be super cool. Yeah. Yeah. I think so too. Yay. Yeah. I, I, I love that Shelly. I was, as you were talking, I was thinking about um, you saying mutual benefit to these things. Like for me, one thing uh, that Kyle also mentioned lighting. So lighting is really critical with narcolepsy of uh, for example, the apartment I'm currently in, my overhead lighting is really limited and being in a Pacific Northwest environment, it gets dark in the winter pretty early. And so lack of lighting can make me sleepier and cause narcolepsy attacks to like occur more frequently before I actually like need to go to bed. But although that's my specific reason for have wanting additional lighting in a room um, when it gets darker, I, I think like Kyle, you also mentioned additional lighting would be helpful for navigation. Um, and additional lighting is just beneficial in general for people to help us keep our week sleep wake cycles going properly. Um, I'm just on the side of things of needing that to the extreme to where I'm, I'm perhaps noticing it more than someone else that, that has a better sleep wake cycle. But I, I love that idea of, of mutual benefit to these design enhancements that it's, it's, Sure, maybe it's stemming from someone who's saying, hey, this is a specific need for me, but that doesn't mean that in general, all consumers can, can benefit from it. Um, that's so yeah, right. I, I'm so sorry. When I work with families, you know, usually I'm drawn in by the one person that has a disability, but every single time the entire family benefits because most of the things that we all need when we're struggling with a disability or a challenge um, you know, often is just the basic support that all human beings um, need. As far as lighting goes, not only do we um, need to think about the amount of lighting, but also um, what temperature that lighting is, you know, where you are and it can be dark and cold for long periods of time. You know, um, there are complicated circadian lighting systems that are really cool to put in, but just the very basic 
thing you can start with is going on Amazon or to your local grocery store and just finding a full spectrum bulb that mimics daylight just to give you that extra boost. And there's just so many things we can do like that that are sensory oriented. Um, sensory design is something I'm extremely interested in just because I think all people, um, we all, there's a spectrum of preferences. Um, I love blackout curtains in my bedroom. Uh, that's not necessarily for any um, disability, but that is a preference. Um, and all of us have noises and smells and um, lighting and patterning and different things around us in our environment every day, all day that a big a portion of us can really sort of drown out, but a lot of people can't as well. And so there are a lot of subtle aggravations, I think, that over time can really um, damage our health and well-being if we're not looking at some of those things. So yeah, these conversations are super important. I, I know that there's there's been several studies and I'll I'll pull them up for when we do our QA with Livable, but there's been plenty of studies on the effects of sound pollution in a living space just for everybody. It adds anxiety. Um, it's gotten as so bad, like in certain areas of New York or really busy uh, metropolitan cities where people can develop heart conditions later on in life because of all the extra anxiety that our brains are constantly trying to process out. So it's, it's a hugely important thing for everybody to have quieter environments, you know, environments where even if it's not every room in the house, at least have some place in your home or apartment where you can have that peace and you can have that quiet and get away from all of the noise. Yeah. And I'll speak for the, the vestibular community. Shelly, I like how you called it the, um, the subtle ag aggravations that kind of accumulate and kind of like what you were talking, Bethany, there are so many different people that benefit from, let's talk about lighting. Um, for the vestibular community, we rely on our eyes to, uh, help our equilibrium. So the darker it gets, the more of the grabbing onto the walls that starts to happen. Mm -hmm. um, that said, there is a specification though, um, where some people that, especially the vestibular migraine community, they um, are really triggered by LEDs. So there's that flicker if you ever have done a slow motion uh, video with your phone and an LED light is in the room, <laughs> you go play that back and you'll see this like really visible flicker. And for some people, they're actually, that's a subtle aggravation and they're registering that flicker in the LED. Um, and so uh, one of my friends had, can, had to replace all the LEDs in her house um, and just go back to the good old fashioned tungsten and it really has helped her a lot. So I've been more mindful of that since the, this filming because I know that we have some LEDs in the house too. And um, it's the screen that we look at, the screen that we're looking at right now on our computer has a, a refresh rate that is really, really high. And those little things can add up by the end of the day, so. Shelly, do you know, do you know if, I think you're, you're muted, do you know if, um all LEDs have that same flicker or if, like you said, the full spectrum lighting ones maybe avoid that because they, they are programmed differently? LEDs definitely can flicker as can fluorescence, which is what we find unfortunately in schools, you know, with children with all different kinds of conditions thrown together under fluorescent lighting that is, can be very irritating. LEDs are getting better. There are now warmer LEDs. They're really working on the temperature and taking it from that sort of irritating blue light to a much warmer temperature in LED lighting. Uh, there's still a long way to go. I know environmentally, you know, for the environment, um, the LEDs last longer and they have a lot of benefits, but um, the transition has been hard for people who are very sensitive to light. So that's definitely something I'm looking into and sort of looking at um, as a designer, um, you know, using more experts. Um, I think a lot of designers are tend to be lone wolves and we think we know everything. But as I'm realizing, um, when I go in to work with someone with a disability, uh, pulling in a lighting specialist or um, another specialist with um, kitchen design or other things are giving me new ways to translate solutions for the people I'm working with that I might not, 
you know, no, I think like with what you do, um, Gustavo, you could help me a lot probably with sound, with dampening sound, with acoustics, with um, creating opportunities for sound that helps us relax. I know one thing I learned in my study of biophilia, which is sort of bringing natural um, elements into your home that can help you relax and maybe drown out the noise pollution you were just discussing is that bird song actually is the most relaxing noise that we could you know program on our sound machines i love to listen to the ocean but bird song goes way back in our dna when the birds are singing usually things are calm and copacetic and i just thought that was an interesting um oh. yeah thing to learn love that i love that yeah yeah, I, that makes me really think about, so sound for me is something that I struggle with immensely because when your sleep-wake cycle is all over the place and you are trying to maintain some semblance of here's when I go to bed, even if going to sleep mm -hmm. is going to be disrupted, if I have sound coming in on top of that. So right now I live in an apartment, if I can hear my neighbors or we're close to a freeway, if I can hear a truck blaring their horn at night, um, sound is really, really critical to, to some, like an, an already fractured sleep becoming more fractured. Uh, not to mention, you know, obviously anyone else might be woken up by the garbage truck at three in the morning that they can hear outside the window. So um, yeah, I, I think that kind of goes back to that mutual benefit and, and also just connecting over the sound machine. I have one as well. Um, so, you know, just, it would be, it would be really, refreshing if it wasn't something where we had to as a as someone who lives here I have to bring in my sound machine and I have to turn it up on high and I've got my fan going and I've got the doors closed and I've got you know as much sound improvement or prevention as possible but if that was something that was already built in to where I didn't have to fight so hard against that I, I that would be such a refreshing way to live <laughs> That's oh. super important for, I think, for uh, city planners, developers, architects, builders to, to know. I think they don't know what they don't know, right? So usually people are looking at the bottom line. What do things cost? And they're always trying to trim costs. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's an important conversation to um, start to let them know that the disability community is one of, well, I think is the largest minority in the world. And not only... The disability community but everybody benefits from less aggravations including the noise pollution and if you design these say thicker walls or better insulation from the beginning i think that it's not cost prohibitive it, the cost is is very minimal and there is a way to market that to let people know all people know that we are a more sensitive company we're more conscious we have really looked into in, you know bettering our hvac systems to be cleaner air we've um, you know done a system to make sure that our water is maybe just above what the typical city quality would be our walls are a little bit thicker i can't imagine that all people wouldn't be excited and drawn to a building um, that is more conscious and um i feel like there is a way if, if people are money motivated that's one of the, the sort of um i guess i'm not a self-pressure but i i'm i really want to be able to get to the people that say you know gee we'd really love to to design better for the disability community it's it's the right thing to do we see that but you know it's just not possible the world we're in the real world and, and it's all about cost i think yeah. that has to go that's an antiquated way to look at the world and like you said we all benefit so um yeah keeping these discussions and even if somehow we have to get data and research to show them that putting a little bit more money in up front does have a bigger roi then let's start looking at those kinds of studies and sharing them as much as we can 100 percent. i think there's two really interesting questions from here and Bethany and Kyle, you both mentioned that you're in graduate school. So mm -hmm. how are, how is the school environment for you? Have they done anything um, with the building designs to make them, you know, more accessible? You know, more more friendly. Is the lighting good? What has that experience been like so far? Uh, luckily for me, I am doing uh, Colorado State University Global is their online portion, so I am comfortable in my home. 
as comfortable as I can be. Uh, but these modifications would help my school day. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, I, so I do go into a building. Um, it's a it's a non traditional school building, actually. So that's not to say uh, I don't still have struggles. I think when it comes to living with a disability, part of that process is constantly having to advocate yourself every time you enter into a new space and environment um, and system. So I I will say that I it's been kind of a mixed bag. Um, something that uh, Shelly, I think it was you that mentioned fluorescence being a problem in schools. I that is to this day one of the things I still don't understand why fluorescents are so common in classrooms in an environment where for me in particular, that is immensely triggering for my narcolepsy. Um, they they trigger my narcolepsy attacks. Um, so often classrooms are fluorescent lights and little windows. Um, so in my current school, we do have more windows than the norm of what I was used to maybe in my undergrad where there were absolutely no windows in most of my classrooms. Um, but that's not to say it's not still a struggle. So it's it's been kind of a mixed bag of trying to investigate okay well we're not gonna they're not gonna change out all the light bulbs so how can I instead advocate for myself to maybe have a standing desk in the back of the classroom um and even in that you know having I think I think that question of money constantly comes up um so it's it's been kind of a mixed bag but lighting is definitely one that has hasn't been the worst school environment I've been in, but I think with any with any classroom setting, those fluorescents will always be triggering for me in particular. I just wanted, I'm curious, how do you advocate for yourself? Is it a one on one conversation with the professor or what, what's some of the ways that you've done that? Yeah, you know, I think I've I've really had to learn how to advocate better for myself. I was diagnosed in undergrad about 11 years ago and I was the undergrad student who didn't advocate for myself at all. I think I was um, unsure of how to go about that. So now being back in school, I feel a lot more empowered um, of how to ask for what I need. So my school does have a system set up where they have a, an accommodations coordinator that we can meet with one-on-one -on -one that mm -hmm. develops plans alongside with us. So that's been immensely helpful to tap into that resource. But for me personally, I think my advocating for myself is also talking to my professors. My disability is going to show up in the classroom and it and it often looks like me falling asleep, which can lead to professors having stigmas around. Is this a studious person? Is this person putting in an effort um, that they should be, you know, question marks around things like that. So something that I do to advocate for myself is have a conversation with every professor that I have and say, this is my disability. This is how it's going to show up. Um, and here's the ways that I that you can help me and or I can help myself that I'm letting you know ahead of time are going to happen. So not not questions as far as can I do these things in the classroom for myself, but more statements of these are the things I will be doing for myself in the classroom because of my disability. And um, I'm I'm lucky to be going to a school that I have not had any professors push against that at all. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think um, it's been important for me to be able to verbalize more often. This is what I'm doing, not this is what I need. Can you provide it? Um, so, so really having that empowerment more. It's amazing. It's really good. The one thing that made me feel frustrated and a, a little bit sad when you were talking about your experience is that you would have to go to a professor or to a school and say, I have an issue and I need a change. And the changes that they'd most likely give you might separate you from the rest of the group. So then your experience is better, but then it's not the same as every other grad student there, right? So just like when a commercial building has an elevator or a ramp, but it's around the side or the back of the building. So the person that has a mobility challenge or is in a wheelchair doesn't get that same experience going through the grand hall or the entry that was created for everybody else. Um, I don't have all the answers to that, but my dream is really that the more we start talking about universally designed buildings that are better for everyone, and those fluorescent lights aren't any better, well, they might be a little less damaging to the professor, but everyone, right, can benefit from upgrading the lighting, getting more 
natural light, et cetera. So the whole concept to push universal design principles is kind of like we, we keep saying that if this was done correctly beforehand, we wouldn't have to have so many individual accommodations. Now, maybe we didn't know before, but we know more now and we're always learning. And so if universal design principles were upfront within our my industry, um, I do think that we could start getting that ball rolling. You know, Gustavo, I know I talk about getting a snowball going and um, just the more we can talk about why this matters, the better. Yeah, I agree. And you, you, you keep saying, uh, talking about the cost and how it uh, constantly boils down to cost. If builders would just have the foresight to see that uh, doing it up front, you're right, it would cost less in the long term. Uh, and I, I, right now is the time for these conversations. I think so many things are changing in the world. This obviously needs to change. Uh, simple modifications. 100%, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. That's a big reason why we're here. Um, but for people, you know, for the design community, for the architects that don't know what universal design is right now, like Shelly, how did you start to learn about it? Where did you get exposed to the ideas? How did you hunt down that information? You're clearly like a very naturally curious person and you had you had the need. So you wanted to improve your family's life and then you wanted to start improving the lives of other families. But where did you go to learn these things to get exposed to it? I knew through just raising my three kids who are 23, 20 and nine, um, that I just was constantly modifying my environment. And um, then I had, you know, all of my, my family friends are, are families that have kids with disability as well. And one of my best friend's daughter is in a wheelchair. So I just started looking at how I could help my friends, other mothers that I was coming into contact with that said, I really need help. And in trying to help them, I had to learn about mobility issues. And then to learn about that, I was kind of started looking into ADA, the American Disabilities Act. I was really shocked actually to, to realize that most of the laws that are supposed to protect people with disabilities have not been around very long. Uh, just in the late nineties, these bills were signed. Um, so gosh, we have such a long way to go. Mm -hmm. And then through just studying ADA and the history of the people that pushed for that, realizing that the world, there's there are several organizations that are global that put together uh, the principles of universal design and kind of just looking at the really big picture on what all human beings need, sort of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but as far as from a design or architecture perspective, what do human beings need and what do we deserve in our built environment? And um, I thought they were fascinating because they talk a lot about equity and dignity and personal fit and experience and things that um, are less tangible than what we discussed as far as, you know, whether someone in a wheelchair can get in or out of a building. There's so many layers. That's just really the, the tip of the iceberg. And I think universal design principles are a good way to start. Um, one example of a really well-designed building um, that I read about is the Guggenheim. If you think mm -hmm. about this um, spiraled building with ramps, whether you have a child in a stroller, whether you are pregnant with triplets, if you have a walker because you're you know, elderly or you have vestibular proprioceptive balance issues, um, more people can enjoy the Guggenheim and, and move around freely. Um, it wouldn't it be great if more buildings, uh, you know, really had that forethought that um, we we're going to support the most people in the best way all the time. And it can be beautiful, like you said in the beginning, Shelley. It reminds me of uh, Brian, one of the gentlemen in the film. He has a, he was a photographer for uh, his career, traveled all over the world, and then had a traumatic brain injury. Um, and he is in a wheelchair now, and he really wanted his home to, uh, he said in the film, I said, I don't want my house to look like a wheelchair house. That was his, that was his thing. And so he hired an architect to create a ramp for the front door, but it was a cobblestone ramp. So he actually, it was a, a stonemason that came and built this 
really beautiful entryway into his home that everybody gets to appreciate. And it just looks like this architectural addition to his home. Um, and, you know, it was like you said, it's a, a piece of dignity. He had a career that was full of, um, you know, the aesthetic and how things are supposed to look. And he didn't want to lose that with his uh, disability. And he didn't, which is beautiful. Yeah, yeah, his house is gorgeous from what I could see. <laughs> that sounds like a badass addition. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it really, it really was. I think the thing he struggles with, and maybe um, something we should address too, is smart technology. Like you said, mm -hmm. Kyle, this is the time. Um, and, and now we have all of this technology kind of colliding with design. And one of the things that both Elizabeth and Brian addressed because of their uh, vocal issues, uh, struggles with the, uh, being able to communicate clearly um, because of the strength of their vocal cords, that a lot of the smart technology doesn't recognize their voices. Um, and so going back to the simplicity of like being able to pick up the phone and call somebody is really challenging when Siri doesn't recognize your voice. Um, so that's something that also my eyes really opened to trying to understand these real basic struggles, even with very advanced technology. Um, it doesn't ex access everybody still. The voice control is definitely improving, but it still has a long way to go. Mm -hmm. There are some interesting technologies around uh, tracking the eyes, uh, gestures, haptic feedback, where you can just move your hand in a certain direction and, and it can trigger a command. Again, these are things that are that are being developed. They haven't really made their way into the the mass market yet, but they're they're getting there and, and voice control that can be tricky. Just like there's not really great voice control the system we work with, they haven't developed it for non-English languages yet. So there's there's a lot of work to still be done. Yeah, absolutely. My son, um, it was a really fun day when my son finally realized that Siri could understand him. He has Down syndrome and he has a really hard time with articulation. And so, you know, trying to get Alexa or Siri to do what he wanted to do, it's it's taken him almost full 10 years to be able to articulate easy enough. And Gustavo, I know you told me that there's some new technologies coming. I feel like um, I'm impatient. They're not coming fast enough. Maybe what we need to do is just the more we talk about this, then the more interest people with this capital uh, can start to put into these technologies. But um, I think it's up to us as a community to really drive that interest so that the money will follow and they realize that we, there's a huge market for this. Um, I did a show house recently in Dallas called the Kipps Bay Decorator Show House. And I'm the first one in a 48 year history to do a space that is what I consider adaptive design. Uh, because of architectural constraints, I couldn't do fully ADA compliant, but over and above just the bathroom being usable for someone in a wheelchair, what was really exciting to me was this smart home technology and um, the muse that I, that I used um, to build this space is actually a real little girl in my life with Rett syndrome. She is nonverbal and she speaks through a retinal device. And so there were some, some systems that I was able to find where through her Toby or her augment, augmentative device, she could use her eyes theoretically to open and close her window shades, to turn on and off her music, to turn on her shower and adjust the temperature. There were several different uh, businesses and sponsors um, like the Shade Store and Kohler that helped me with this. And it was super exciting to share this with the 12,000 people that came through this decorator show house that um, you could have a person with disability be autonomous and have independence in a beautiful room outfitted with gorgeous grab bars and decorated to the hilt, but that also really supported her emotionally and intellectually to be able to do what she wanted to do without having necessarily a caregiver do it for her. And that's wow. really exciting. Yeah. You wow. mentioned uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It sounds like we need to develop a hierarchy of needs for livable design. Uh, yeah, let's do it. Great idea. Let's add on to the universal design principles. Yeah. Uh, any, any feedback that you could give the community that I could share would be truly valuable. I love that idea. Absolutely. I know that I've thought a lot in the last year about 
universal design, and we've spoken many times about this, Shelley. Um, the cost thing is is so interesting because if we stop for just take a step back for a moment and kind of see the forest instead of the trees, right? I think that we get lost in the trees so easily. If we take a step back and we say, are all the buildings and all the homes that we are creating, obviously maximizing profit, okay, that's important. But are we really doing the bare minimum with all of these buildings and all of these homes? We're not. We're trying to make them better. We're trying to make them more aesthetically pleasing. We're putting money into these buildings and into these homes to improve them, to make them more resellable or because somebody wants a fancy theater, which we do, it's great, but why aren't we, cost isn't the option or the obstacle there. Why aren't we raising the bar for all of these other needs that we all have? What about aging in place? As we get older, don't we still want our independence in our homes? Do we, do oh, yeah. we want our grandparents? Do we want our, 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 our mothers and fathers to go to an assisted living facility if they don't have to? It's just, I think, I'm hoping that it's just about opening minds and hearts to realizing this stuff is out there already. It's getting better. Why aren't we doing it? Well, some of it, I think, is just marketing. It's a, it's a mind shift. I talked to an architect recently who wants to be a leader in her architectural community. Uh, her tagline is, we help people stay in homes they love longer. And we were talking about how much people as they age have resisted retirement and how we know scientifically that retirement can precipitate uh, people's health starting to decline and why more people want to work longer. So if we don't want to retire, why would we want to retire our homes? You work your whole life to build wealth or at least stability and have this beautiful home that you love. But if you're not thinking about how to protect your home as you are your um, your retirement plan, you know, finance, we have financial planners that help us plan for retirement, but we don't have people really talking about how to make sure you don't have to retire your own house and move out of it and end up in a, in this, an assisted living facility or a nursing home. Um, so just maybe talking about it more, letting people know that just as you want to lengthen your life, you want to also lengthen an opportunity to stay in a place that feels good to you and that supports your health the best. Um, so yeah, conversations like this are, are, um, I think going to start to lead the way to like, let's really think about what works for most people and what is the better return on investment long-term. Yeah. And you're talking about, uh, uh just older people, uh, wanting to extend the time in their home. Um, that it, living independently is something that uh, with my progressive disability is a huge concern. I'm only 31 years old uh, and uh, it, it terrifies me to think that I could not live on my own. And so, yeah, it's uh, not just the old people. I'm only 31. I got a long way to go before I'm an old person. That's so I, I, need, I need to figure out what to do uh, in the case that uh, it does continue to progress drastically. Um, my, I, I could never have predicted my disease to progress this much in my entire life. Um, so uh, it's certainly something I gotta consider uh, and the younger people too. Kyle, I wanna know um, one of the things that, you know, I know you emphasize a lot is, is the, the, the workouts and the physical therapy that you do are constantly doing to try to keep some of that, that muscle tone working and the synapses firing. Yeah. Um, can you like imagine aside, you know, we have the rock climbing walls, but can you imagine a home that would like even facilitate that even more so that your mission, amazing. like, what would that look like? That would be so cool. I don't know. Uh, I, I work out uh, like you said, I have all these videos, uh, but I'm wanting to set my space up differently uh, to be more conducive to that. 
so it can be like uh, I've got a an adjustable standing desk, which is great. It's part of my physical therapy, honestly, so that I'm not uh, during the whole school day, not just at my desk. Uh, I can adjust it to stand up uh, and yeah. So, oh my gosh, it would be so great to have a house, an entire house that was conducive to my lifestyle of uh, health and wellness. Yeah. So, hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it becomes like your house becomes your, your gymnasium slash physical therapy space. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it kind of already is since I got stairs that I have to go up and down every day. Yeah. Uh, which is ridiculous in, in my physical state. Yeah, those are some scary, sketchy stairs, as you they call are. them in the video. <laughs> yeah, I, I fell down those stairs and broke a bunch of ribs. And oh. uh, oof. I, that does not need to be happening. <laughs> no. You're right. There are a lot of people that study um, falls and how much they cost taxpayers, et cetera. And again, I hate to always bring it back to money, but for whatever reason, when I talk with um, anybody that's part of um, big business or legislation, it feels like that's always what they bring up. And so um, because I... I, I'm frustrated with that, but I feel like we have to meet them where they are too. And so there's so many ways, even if we say, look, you know, falls cost our country X amount per year. And if we could do better to um, force insurance companies to pay for more durable medical equipment and for home modifications for people that need it like you, um, then we're going to save overall so much money to, to empower these people and to keep them safe saves us over time um but it's a complicated situation yeah. um but with with COVID, it was exciting to see that more people are starting to really look at what a home environment does for us and uh, home gyms are on the rise and this might be more in the luxury sector but people are really starting to think about okay well we're spending a lot of time indoors and now a lot of us are working at home let's look at how we can um, create a home that can give us more physical uh, support as far okay. as exercise, uh, yoga rooms, the meditation rooms, the sensory rooms. There's lots of cool niches, if you will, that are coming up. If if designers and, and builders were interested in that, um, I think there's going to be a swell of demand for rooms that are not only physically supportive but also emotionally supportive within the home. Uh, again, I, I think now is the time. Uh, I think there's such uh, a trend an upward trend in health and wellness and uh, this is what people are considering. So yeah, now is our time. <laughs> Shelly, have you seen, okay, so what about if we're talking about our homes enhancing um, and making us even healthier so we don't have, we can age in place um, and we don't have to go to these homes that are filled with, you know, bad food and minimal exercise and bad lighting. Um, what about with our smart watches that was somehow paired to some of the smart home technology so that let's say we were having a stressful day, we're on our way home, our smart watch tells our smart home device that we're having a stressful day and already dims the lights and puts the bird song in or like it can register before we even know that our cortisol is starting to go up and our sympathetic nervous system is activated what if it becomes a place that actually can you know calm us down before we even know that we're starting to get amped up does that yeah. exist <laughs> uh, well it's, it sounds a little Jetsons to me, but you know what? A lot of things <laughs> on, on Jetsons have, have come to fruition. Um, there, yeah. The technology, parts of those technologies do exist. Mm -hmm. um, again, a lot of them are, are super expensive right now, but for example, you can put in a circadian lighting system and knowing that certain parts of the day are more difficult, or if, like if you have narcolepsy and you know that you need lighting to be strong for, for the late afternoon and not get dark until later, you can put some systems in and pre-program them. Mm -hmm. But again, you have to kind of know that overall, you know, these are the times when I'm stressed and this is the time where I'd want to decompress. And so you can, well, let's, I'm trying to think just off the top of my head, um, 
of a really inexpensive example, maybe like putting your lamps on a timer, you know, just to kind of help you. But again, these things are sort of preconceived by you and then set by you. The only technology that I've heard of thus far that can sort of read your vitals and then respond. Um, there is um, a company called Level Up Your Home. I just talked to the CEO, um, Jen Millette, and she asked me if I had any clients that had seizures. And I said, yes, absolutely. I have friends whose kids have seizures and um, they're not sleeping either because they're afraid to leave their children home at, I'm not home, excuse me, in their bedrooms at night, you know, because they're scared that if they start to seize, they won't be right there and they won't know. She has a mattress pad. Uh, that she was telling me about that can go onto the bed and can read vitals of someone sleeping on this mattress pad and if they do show signs of starting to seize then the parent is alerted i don't know the details on that but that too kind of sounds jetsons but like super exciting and important yeah. so that everybody can kind of relax and have their own space but if something's happening um they get that information right away and i know my my father-in-law has an apple watch um if he say, starts yeah. to fall, there's like velocity that, you know, can be measured. And then his caregiver is alerted on her iPhone that he possibly has fallen. So, I mean, these things are kind of creeping up and um, technology is there. Yeah, I think it's possible. Yes, I think it's really getting there. Yeah. Gustavo, have you seen some technologies like this? Uh, not, not yet. So the the constraints that we run into, even at the very high end, is that a lot of these technology companies don't like to play nice with each other. So you can have an Apple Watch and you can have another uh, a home automation system that isn't from Apple, you know, that Apple doesn't want to share that data and that technology and open it up to those other companies. So integrating becomes a real problem unless you are committed to being in a fully Apple ecosystem or a fully Amazon ecosystem. And then of course, as we all know, um, there's privacy issues. And a lot of these big companies who develop this great technology are not so responsible when it comes to what data they're sharing and what data they're reselling. And there's, there's some concerns there, especially when you get into the health space, right? I don't want Amazon knowing all of that. And this is just a personal choice. I don't want Amazon to know that about me. And so as these, as the technology develops, I think that there will be smaller companies like this mattress company that we can feel safer. We pick up the phone, we can talk to somebody, we can know where they stand and that's going to improve over time. The big technology companies, you have to be a little bit more careful with. Interesting. Yeah, that's, that's really frustrating. Um, and I can see where privacy with data would be an issue. Um, you know, not fair, and I'm not a fatalist or anything like that, but I could see where if, say, Amazon or some big company had a lot of data about your health and how many times that fall sensor went off and an insurance company might want to buy that data and, you know, use that to determine who they're going to insure and yeah, unfortunately, that that could be tricky. Um, you know, there's not a lot of super easy answers to those really big questions about how do we make this better globally. Um, but we've got to start one step at a time. And there are technologies out there, like we said, just with buying full spectrum bulbs or buying better uh, filters for your HVAC. There's lots of little things that we can do as self advocates. Um, and as allies to the disability community, as designers, um, the more that I can teach other designers how to even start. Most designers, I don't think, even have considered that part of what they can offer their clients is better water or better air. Most designers are thinking about objects, right? They're thinking about furnishings and aesthetics and maybe ergonomics, you know, maybe entry and exit from a bathroom, maybe ADA, but usually not better lighting unless it's about art, right? So I think just expanding our knowledge of what interiors entails, they're just like with disability. I think there, there's so much that's invisible and because it's not visible, we're not sure it's there or we're not taught about, you know, taught about these things. Um, 
So just, you know, having this kind of a conversation is super important. I think even though it seems simple and, you know, disability 101 that, you know, that I don't know how many disabilities there are out there, but I'm sure a majority are probably invisible. Um, just to keep talking about this and letting people know that there's so much out there that we're not looking at or that we don't even know is there, but knowledge is the key. You know, that's the power. Just knowing that this is a concern and just keeping at it, keep educating people, not because we feel we have to, but because we want to empower them to help empower us. I mean, I think it's a, it's a mutually beneficial thing and it should be symbiotic to empower each other. Good. You know, not something we're really asking for. It's like, let's do this together. We're not asking for a handout. We're asking for you to help us empower ourselves so that we can give back to the, your community as well. Mm -hmm. That's really powerful. I, and I agree 100%. And what really drew me to universal design, having never heard about it until a year ago, a little, sorry, a little longer than that, is it gives you the framework to start having those conversations and to start opening up your mind as to what's possible so that whoever comes through, you, you have this incredibly broad and individualized framework that you can use to either say, I don't know how to do this. I'm going to go find out, but I know that much more is possible than what I think is possible, which, which is empowering because I was born with multiple physical disabilities as well. And, and my biggest struggle has been, I want to be seen. I want to be heard. I want the ability to contribute and give back just like everybody else. So why not make that better? Why is it always the individual that has to adapt to the environment. Let's turn that around a little bit. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, there's a simple meme that goes around on Instagram that always makes me uh, smile and cringe at the same time. It's like, if a plant is not doing well, we don't blame the plant. We put them in a new environment. We look at what factors are affecting that. <laughs> what do they need more of? What do they need less of? Why are we not doing this for for our humankind, for our brothers and sisters, it doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, so it's it's necessary to, to change that mindset. And I know it's possible. And especially like the people that are living with this, um, we do have a real opportunity to educate and teach others. We have a voice. So, you know, let's use it. Let's continue to talk about this and see what we can do as, as, a, as a group. I have a new film goal after this conversation. Let's, okay, let's write a grant to go down to Kyle's house. It needs to be remodeled anyway. Let's Good use time. the whole house as an example, an, an educational yeah. model, make it the coolest thing ever. So Kyle, you will never have to leave that home. You will God. be supported. <laughs> All of a sudden I'm like, this has to happen. Oh. <laughs> Would that That's not be amazing? amazing? Yeah. yeah. It, there, it are, be, there, it yeah, there are shows out there like this. In fact, yeah. one of my favorites is George to the Rescue. It's on NBC and they have all of their episodes from the past 10 years on YouTube. And they do exactly this. They go in and yeah. renovate, do home modification and share it with the world. And um, unfortunately, wow. they've been on for 10 years and they're not prime time. However, they just won an Emmy. So like you're saying, this is the time. Like, I think people are finally yeah. like, we're done with drama. We want feel good TV. We want to see people helping people. We want to pull together. We are tired of being separate and alone and scared about the world. We want to look for the helpers, right? And we want to look for the good. And so I think it's absolutely possible to find a group that would be interested in sponsoring a remodel for you. So we should definitely look into that. That, that would, would be so cool. cool. Yes. Uh, I was really encouraged the other day. I was on Amazon and they had a, a, a category uh, celebrating diversity with disability. And it was Excellent. all these programs, uh, documentaries, movies with people that have disabilities. Wow. Um, uh, so again, now is our time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, there's not a single one of us that don't love someone dearly that has a disability. And again, uh, we all will at some point in our lives. That's something that every single human being uh, will experience. And mm -hmm. so it doesn't make sense to pretend it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, 
you know, at first blush, people think it's um, something negative. It's scary. It's confronting. You know, what if if I'm if I get super involved with this person and what if what if I you know, that makes me look at my mortality. Um, but actually, yeah. it sort of does the opposite. It's it's a very empowering um, thing that I've learned at where before I had my kids and especially Ronan with Down syndrome, I remember being at the grocery store and seeing an adult with intellectual disability, mm -hmm. you know, bagging groceries and thinking, oh, I don't know if I want to go through that line because I don't have to talk to them. And maybe it wasn't even that conscious, but there's just a little feeling of being uncomfortable. Uh, of course, now that I know better um, and how much these, you know, we can empower each other's lives, I go and seek out people and introduce myself and find out more about them. And it's just made my life so much more meaningful. So I think just continuing to share these stories and that. Um, yeah, we got to get rid of the stigma. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It, There's nothing scary about being human. I mean, no, no. no. And in your case, Bethany, with the stigma, it unfortunately you kind of it almost is on your shoulders to speak about it because people won't see it necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, same with me. It's it's on the onus is on us actually to to start those conversations. Yeah, definitely. We're doing it. Yeah, there's I think we're we're getting close to the time here where we have to wrap this up and we will in a second, but the point about the getting rid of the stigma around disability and people kind of feeling uncomfortable about their own mortality and what can happen to them. I know some really amazing people in the palliative care space. I know Kimberly does too. And when you speak to them and they're helping people end of life or who have an illness and they're dying, they're helping them through that process. And you ask them, what have you learned about this? And they say, what I've learned is it isn't even about death, it's about life. So they've flipped the script. The mm -hmm. more we confront, the more we understand, the more we move towards, the more we can appreciate what being alive means and how we can all make our lives just a little bit better. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. This is such an inspiring conversation. I, I, I hope that, um, you know, the q and A. I I think everyone else that's watching this is going to have a lot of questions too. So I hope this conversation continues. Absolutely. Is there anything that we've missed in, the, in this conversation that anybody would like to add before we sign off? I think I just wanted to add something there on the end of what we were saying of um, you know, the idea that we will all, all eventually have a disability when we get older, but also the idea that at any moment, something can happen and you will have a disability mm -hmm. um that can change in an instant yeah that, that was mine it happened no. overnight yep. yeah and so if we were designing spaces that were already like welcoming for that you're not only would you not not only would you have not have like the life adjustment but to have to home adjust in the midst of that process like if it's already there that, that, that would be beautiful if we could already be saying, you know, your, your home is welcome for you. If you're able-bodied, if you're not able-bodied, if you're neurologically, you know, struggling like I do. So I, I just, I just think that that can change at any moment. And, and often we take that for granted. For sure. That's a really good point. So yeah, we have to raise the, the bare minimum standard is the expectation of disability so as to not need an adjustment or a modification to the house. Yeah. Well, that's true. I, I, I will close with my final thought on um, what disability is. If you were in a completely 100% supportive space, would there even be a disability? Um, the disability is experienced when someone is in an environment that doesn't support them and there's constant barriers, you know, and, and so it feels more glaring, if that makes sense. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I'm proud to be on this panel with you all and thank you for letting me join. I feel so inspired and uh, just ready to just keep, keep pushing, keep moving forward. So I really am honored to be a part of this. Thanks, Gustavo. Yeah, thank you so much, thank Gustavo, you. for pulling this together. And thank you everyone for sharing. I'm, I'm so, so inspired. Oh, you're yeah, very welcome. Thank yeah, thank you all for being here. This is this is the start of this is the beginning, a new beginning for all of us. And we really appreciate Livable giving us this platform to be here and talk this through today. 
Thank you all so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>